Dichiaro aperta la quarta I formally open the fourth session of uh, discussion di on the parliamentary contribution to reaching the goals of COP26. I call on the first of our keynote speakers, the President of the Committee on Ecological Transition and Democratic Challenge of the Spanish Congress of Deputies, Juan Antonio Lopez de Orral de Guerra India. Yes. Thank you very much, President. With your permission, I will speak in Spanish. I would like to start by thanking the Italian Parliament and the IPU for organizing this meeting, which I think is extremely important. The fight against climate change must necessarily be a global one, since we are facing a phenomenon whose origin and impacts are global in nature. Science is defin definitive here. Human action is having an effect on the climate. The efforts to mitigate and reduce climate change causing emissions must therefore necessarily be shared by the entire international community. I agree with what has been said. We all have responsibilities. There are some people and some countries that have higher historical responsibility. COP26 is a very important meeting. It's another momentous meeting because at that meeting all governments must update their emissions reduction commitments. This update needs to be ambitious in order to avoid an increase in global temperatures above 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this is where national parliaments play an extremely key role. We have long talked about thinking globally, acting locally. And in the climate struggle, we have a very good example of the importance of putting this into practice. Without global commitment, you cannot be effective in the fight against climate change. But without local action, international agreements would be useless. Both before and after COP26, it's essential that national parliaments act, first to apply pressure, then to evaluate and implement the measures that guarantee that these commitments are met. I think that the inclusion and involvement of national parliaments in international meetings on climate change is essential because I have the feeling that in the past, the COPs were not really connected to reality in many countries and countries were not meeting their commitments. So I think that that's why we're in the situation we're in now when where we are seeing a still CO2 being emitted and commitments not being met. This situation needs to change and that's why this meeting is so important. I think it's very important to have the participation of members of parliament from many countries. So it's a very good meeting we're having here today. Let me dwell for a moment on the actions of the Spanish parliament. Over the past few years, we have had the joint commission for the study of climate change in our uh, country. It has worked intensively and has prepared a full general report which has correlated scientific knowledge in political, technical, economic and social action in our country. It also included a series of conclusions and recommendations addressed to the government, to all the institutions and ultimately to the whole of Spanish society. And then there's the issue of the awareness of the seriousness of the problem. And in September 2019, the Congress of Deputies approved the declaration of a climate emergency, a manifesto that urged the government to act urgently against climate change. And that's why we have this manifesto now. It's very important. We need to recognize politically the reality that we are hearing from our young people in this on the streets. 
We have also approved the law on climate change and the energy transition, a law that establishes the cross-cutting framework in which national priorities must be developed to achieve the objectives set by the Paris Agreement and the European Union. I'd like to focus on some measures now related to this climate change law. For example, one of the things in our climate change law is the prohibition of uh, the extraction of fossil fuels from our soil. This is very important because the scientific community has been telling us for a long time that fossil fuels need to remain in the ground. And we are putting measures in place to make sure that this happens. We are also establishing a decarbonization fund. We are going to make sure that we have 100 percent of energy provided by renewable sources in the future. Renewable energies should provide 74 percent of electricity by 2030 and 42 percent of total energy. The law also establishes for cities of more than 50,000 inhabitants the obligation to establish low emission zones. The law also creates the Citizens' Assembly Against Climate Change. And the law has also created a scientific committee to oversee climate policies. And something else which has been established by this law is something which we have been speaking about over the past two days, the principle of a just transition that should guide the energy transition. This is part of this law as well. To increase ambition and reach that common goal that should move us all which is to avoid an increase in temperatures above 1.5 degrees Celsius. We need to make sure that we have cross-cutting policies here. We need to have commitments to fight against climate change. But all of our parliaments need to be involved in this effort. I invite everyone here to work on implementing measures to comply with the Paris Agreement and other agreements, these measures are all well and good, but they need to come off of the paper and be implemented on the ground. Thank you. Invito ora ad intervenire la Presidente. I now call on the Chair of the Climate Change Committee of the National Assembly of Pakistan, Ms. Munasa Hassan. In Chamber of Deputies, Mr. Roberto Fico, fellow parliamentarians, good afternoon. I start by quoting international development genius and economist, Dr. Mehboobul Haq. The real wealth of a nation is its people, and the purpose of development is to create an enabling environment for people to enjoy long, healthy and creative lives. This simple but powerful truth is too often forgotten in the pursuit of material and financial wealth. Climate change affects human life and well-being through extreme weather and wildfires, decreased air quality and disease transmission, threatening food and water supplies. It has increased mortality rates and population movement disproportionately. In the fight of haves and have-nots, we fear that our global economic system will destroy the basis of life on this planet until it is too late. Fellow parliamentarians, from Himalayas in north of Pakistan to deserts of southwestern Balochistan to mangroves of southern Sindh, this country's environmental habitat is spellbinding, but it is under threat. Human-caused global warming imposes high risks of frequent monsoons in Pakistan, melting Himalayan glaciers on the Indus River, decreased capacity of water reservoirs, reduced 
hydropower during drought period and extreme flash floods. Subsequently, this impacts severe water shortage, food insecurity due to decreasing agriculture and livestock production, prevalent pests and weeds, degradation of ecosystems, and biodiversity loss. Pakistan is ranked globally in the top 10 countries most affected by climate change in the past 20 years. We have lost 0.53% per unit GDP and have suffered economic losses of over 4 billion US dollars. The Arabian Sea has been heating up with the average surface temperature rising from 29 to 31 degrees Celsius in just two years. This has fueled formation of storms that push the sea into southern coastal communities of Karachi, Gawadar, and Gadani. Sadly, it was, it was due to same unpredictable harsh weather and changing climate patterns that Italian and British climbers lost their lives, stranded at Naga Parbat in Himalayas in March 2019. The political leadership of Premier Imran Khan has set the global desire for climate action into practice. His vision for climate change mitigation has amplified Pakistan's multiple initiatives into global development agenda on environment preservation. The fact that Parliament of Pakistan is the first legislator to go green using solar energy sets benchmark for a clean environment. We have encouraged a social change towards net metering. As a common phenomenon in the country, our groundbreaking 10 billion tree tsunami, nationwide programs to preserve forest and wildlife, water sanitation and blue carbon initiative are some of the landmark achievements. We are tapping the potential of eco-terrorism for prioritizing conservation, empowering local communities, and sustainable travel. As the pandemic hit our economies, Pakistan's world-famous 10 billion tree tsunami ensured job creation and commercial opportunity for thousands of people across the country. Recognized globally, the intervention was recently, recently quoted as a best practice by the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the 76th United Nations General Assembly. Coupled with region's largest social safety net programs to help vulnerable people living below poverty line, our SARS program has prioritized green initiative, cross-cutting all sectors of human development. Parliament of Pakistan is fully cognizant of its international commitments. Pakistan, despite being among the top 10 countries affected by climate change, is one of the lowest producers of carbon emission. With less than 1% of the global emissions as representative of people, responsibility for effective oversight lies on us. A first for Pakistan's parliamentary history the creation of an innovative climate change knowledge hub, institutionalized, evidence-based policy making, expert reviews, and civil society engagement. In spirit of participatory public policy, we have developed a countrywide mechanism to engage with academia, think tanks, and intelligentsia. We are responsible to sensitize our public and ensure citizen ownership to protect and preserve Mother Earth. We must ensure that governments work transparently, are answerable, and bring all stakeholders from private sector, business community, women leaders, youth, and academia together. I'm a strong believer that within parliamentary system lies a means of outreach effective oversight that is imperative for a sufficient functioning of any government. 
Climate change is one of the defining challenges of our times. Cooperative, forward-looking policies at regional and global levels. Developed countries should take a voluntary approach to financially support the efforts of developing countries in building clean, climate-resilient future. Advanced economies must adhere to their financial commitments for mitigation and adaptation of climate solutions. We must not forget that as parliamentarians, history will not judge us on the basis of how advanced our age was, but the kind of planet that we leave for our children as inheritance. As I conclude, I remind you that this is our moment. We cannot turn back time. With this, I end. Thank you very much. We now move to the discussion. I would like to remind you that each speaker in the discussion has two minutes' time available. On my list, I have Konstantin Kozachev, Vice President of the Council of the Russian Federation. Non lo vedo. I don't see him here. Let's move on. Fauzi Salim, First Vice President of the Chamber of Representatives of Libya. Thank you, Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank every person who contributed to the organization of this reunion. In this meeting, we've been talking a lot about climate. Scientists agree that we are heading towards a world where temperature is going to increase by about 4 degrees Celsius very soon. The consequences are going to be dramatic, and we will feel those consequences in every part of the globe. Therefore, parliamentarians have a major part to play in order to make COP26 a success, and our mission is the following. First of all, Parliaments need to solve the problem of nuclear waste buried in poor countries. There is also the issue of toxic waste resulting from conflicts and buried generally in poorer countries. This is a problem that international organizations and parliamentarians need to tackle. It is a humanitarian duty to all of us. Second, support to developing countries is of paramount importance. A strategic support is necessary and only fair if we are to tackle climate change. On the other hand, we also need bigger contributions from developed countries in order to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Developing countries, for their part, need to continue exerting efforts in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Furthermore, the Paris Agreement needs to be implemented effectively. New legislations at the national level need to be adopted. Thank you. Next on my list, Hortense Martin, Martins, uh, member of the um, Assembly of the Republic of Portugal. Dear colleagues, it's an honor to be able to address you once again. We are no longer standing at a crossroads. We have learned that greenhouse gas emissions due to human action are responsible for approximately 1.1 degree Celsius of warming. Global temperatures 
are expected to reach or exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2040. Rising sea levels, deadly tropical storms, melting glaciers, ranging fi raging fires. We have all heard about this and learned about this before. We know that this is happening and will only get worse. We parliamentarians are faced with one of the most important missions of our lives. We must use the power vested in us to ensure and to oversee the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We have legislative and budgetary functions that we must use now more than ever as tools to ensure the implementation of the agreement we signed in 2015. Portugal was one of the first European countries to do so in 2016 when the agreement was ratified. In Marrakesh, Portugal announced that it would achieve its carbon neutrality goal by 2050. It was the first nation in the world to make this commitment. The approval of the European climate law was the great achievement of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union, and it reaffirmed Europe's commitment to the Paris Agreement, maintaining its position as a leader in the world in the fight against climate change. It is imperative to have good environmental governance to be able to ensure clean and sustainable development. We have the knowledge, we have the means, and we need to do it. Thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you. Next on my list is uh, Didier Mumengi Chiskudi, member of the Senate of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Merci. Thank you, President Fico. The Parliament of the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo is uh, asking for the floor to sound the alarm bell. Desertification is on the doorstep of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the second green lung of the planet. In 20 years, the desert has encroached onto more and more of our land. Thus, the 152 million hectares of forest, or nearly 10% of the world's tropical forests, are now at risk. The Kalahari Desert is also encroaching on our water reserves. It threatens our continent's leading water power, which accounts for between 52 and 55 percent of all of Africa's freshwater reserves. The President of the Senate of our country has launched an initiative to address the risks of desertification and land degradation in our country. This is a major initiative. And we would like now to address the G20 countries that are responsible for 80% of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Please show your solidarity by supporting this initiative. We'd like to thank all the parliaments of the world for providing their support to this major initiative as we address these crises. Thank you. Thank you. On my list, I have uh, Saud Al Rawali, member of the Council of the Shura of Saudi Arabia. Avanti. So let us move on. Katia Regina de Vreu, President of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee of the Federal Senate of Brazil. Let's move on. 
We have uh, Barry Jean Ponce, President of the Economic Science, Technology, Environment uh, Committee of the Parliamentary Assembly of uh, OSCE. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. As um, President of the OSCE uh, Assembly, which um, has more than 123 members of parliament from 57 countries, which have approved the Paris Agreement, and uh, which has more than a thousand uh, million citizens in our organizations. And we would like to make four points in an organization which deals with equality. Women are going to be very much affected by climate change and uh, human rights and uh, climate. Uh, first points we'd like to uh, say, we think that there will be global security if there's climate security. Climate and peace go hand in hand. If they go hand in hand, we will find ourselves faced by complications because of scarce resources and obviously social discontent, uh, which may lead to climate wars. I'd like to say something about what Mr. Alde said about the reasons why we're here. We have a historical uh, opportunity in order to make changes. The biggest revolution we can bring about is to um, bring the uh, international um, treaties to the uh, book of laws of our countries to apply these treaties. Uh, third point, I think that we, ha we have time to uh, solve the challenge, but we're faced by a cultural challenge. We can't uh, do the same things in different, with different levels of energy. We really have to change, and we have to be open. Many of the members of parliament have here have said this. They've said that we need to um, raise and mobilize resources. That is a major challenge. and. Uh, nobody with these uh, resources should be left behind in this challenge. Many thanks to um, you. Uh, okay. Thank you. On my list, I have Sayed Mehdi Farshadan, member of the Islamic Parliament of Iran. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful first. Ladies and gentlemen, first I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this global conference. We must keep in mind that the long-term goals of UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement will only be achieved if developed countries adhere to their obligations under uh, the Convention and the Paris Agreement. In this uh, regard, developed countries must take real measures to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to provide adequate, predictable, and timely support, including financing and transfer of technology. I just wish to reiterate adherence to the principles of common uh, but differentiated responsibility, fairness, and flexibility towards developing countries are crucial to their success under the Convention and Agreement. It is clear that in order to protect the environment and tackle climate change, there should be no political pretext for preventing the allocation of financial resources, transfer of knowledge, and technological support to related activities in developing countries through relevant institutions in international financial agencies and multilateral development banks. Another point. Iran's making a formal protest against the uncalled for statements made by the Yemeni speaker yesterday, who turned the specialized subject of this conference to a political instrument against Iran. We are making efforts to stop the software tanker turning into an environment crisis. As a rule, Iran's democratic efforts for peace in Yemen and thus solving the problem of tanker can be recognized in the language of Iranian diplomacy with the United Nations, not in reading out of dictated text. Is it possible to expel an indigenous population uh, from its country? What an invalid logic. Dear colleague, finally, on behalf of the Islamic Parliament, I reaffirm that Iran is ready to share its valuable experience or any cooperation at the bilateral, multilateral, regional, and international levels in line with global goals to combat climate change. We are committed to strong and effective parliamentary cooperation with the world's parliament, especially our neighbors. Thank you for your kind attention. Grazie. Thank you. I now have on my list Carlos A. Obama, 
member of the Senate of Equatorial Guinea. Thank you, Mr. President. Climate change is a real problem. It is an evil which affects the world and which no one is free from. And it means that uh, all countries which have signed the Paris Agreement have to carry out policies aimed at uh, achieving the goals uh, established. With this in mind, uh, we have always uh, tried to strengthen this uh, idea. The parliamentary representation of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea has, um, would like to inform the me distinguished members that uh, we have uh, decided on a number of actions to implement uh, the uh, COP agreements. Based on what we've said, we want to point out that the country has committed to uh, reduce its emissions by 20% in 2030 and to reach a 50% reduction by 2050 with regard and in mitigation between 2018 and 2020 the country had carried out a study of the causes of deforestation and uh, deterioration of forests we are also going to carry out a country strategy to uh, reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases as well as a plan to reduce the uh, uprooting of uh, forests with the support of uh, with the support of FAO with funding of the initiative for forestry management in uh, Central Africa. We've been uh, negotiating a national plan with which for which we're working for with the Green Fund for the Green Fund for the Environment, which is um, involved in our plan, I'd like to uh, communicate to the members that uh, access to funds is a major obstacle for our region and uh, for the uh, Equatorial Guinea in particular, because the procedure for financial. Uh, input is very complicated, very complex. So we wish uh, to see hope given to allow all countries of the world to respond to these challenges. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. On my list I have Dionisia Theodora Avgerinopoulou, President of the Environment Committee of the Hellenic Parliament. I apologize for his pronunciation. Your Excellencies, dear friends and colleagues, I'm very honored to address our pre-COP26 parliamentary meeting today. IPU is the most historic and important parliamentary actor in global environmental governance. And united, under the, under, under the IPU auspices, we can respond to climate agency. I would also like to thank the Italian Parliament for hosting us. We parliamentarians have a key role to play, and now more than ever, we are mandated by our people to combat the climate crisis by adapting even more ambitious legislative action. In Greece, we support full implementation of the UNFCCC and of the Paris Agreement. We are moving towards a complete phase-out of lignite and an important increase of renewable sources of energy in our energy mix as early as 2025. We aim at a just transition and a green, inclusive, digital and sustainable pandemic recovery. We call for enforced global action in order the average global temperature increase not to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius. For new and additional finance for environmental and climate infrastructure and green jobs. For deeper cooperation in building resilience in our countries in order to prevent and respond natural disasters, including wildfires for additional support to science, technology, and innovation in order to absorb excessive CO2 and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere 
protect biodiversity, achieve a zero waste and a zero carbon economy by 2050, and for the acceleration of mitigation and adaptation efforts in a spirit of solidarity and in harmony with nature. Thank you very much. Grazie molto. Thank you. On my list, I have uh, Christian Lohr, member of the National Council of Switzerland. Let's move on then. I have on my list Yuan Tsu, Vice President of the Committee for Environmental Protection and Conservation of Resources, a member of the Standing Committee of the National Assembly of the People of China. It is a video message. Dear friend, greetings from Beijing, China. Good day to you all. Climate change is a severe challenge facing mankind. The international community should work together with greater ambition and stronger action than ever to meet the climate challenge and achieve harmony between man and nature. All countries should act in accordance with the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, actively shoulder responsibilities, commit to green and sustainable development, and jointly work for the biggest denominator in global climate governance. President Xi Jinping of China has emphasized on many occasions that we are working hard to address climate change, not because others want us to do it, rather we are doing it of our own accord. China has always been actively undertaking international responsibilities according to our national conditions and has kept raising the bar for itself and intensifying its actions against climate change. In September last year, President Xi Jinping announced China's goal of striving to peak carbon emission before 2030 and achieving carbon neutrality before 2060 which will require tremendous hard work. And just recently, at the general debate of the 76th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations on September 21st, President Xi stated that China will step up support for other developing countries in developing green and low carbon energy and will not build new coal-fired power projects abroad. On the subject of addressing climate change, the National People's Congress of China has developed over 30 pieces of legislation related to environmental protection and resources conservation, which also include laws regarding climate change. In August 2009, the MPC Standing Committee made a resolution on actively addressing climate change in a bid to advance China's climate efforts in accordance with law. Meanwhile, supervision and inspection has been increased for the implementation of the laws to ensure their effective execution. The COP26 United Nations Climate Change Conference will soon take place. China will continue to take an active and constructive part in the conference and work together with all parties to the convention in a joint effort to promote the effective implementation of the Paris Agreement. Thank you all for your kind attention. Grazie. Thank you. I now have on my list Brian Ledden, member of the House of Representatives of Ireland. Hey, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fellow members of Parliament, as chair of the Committee on Environment and Climate Action in the Irish Parliament, I, along with my fellow committee colleagues beside me here, am here in solidarity with you. 
We are listening and we are learning from your successes. We are sharing and we are considering each other's challenges. This year, Ireland passed into law one of the most ambitious decarbonisation pathways in the world. Our Climate Act requires us to reduce our emissions by over 50% within a single decade. Our ambitious path ahead will be challenging, but the path to get here has been inspiring because our story started with our people. Due to the immense work of grassroots campaigners, a citizens' assembly on climate change was formed. 99 women and men listened to and engaged with experts and produced a groundbreaking list of recommendations. Our Parliament's cross-party climate committee endorsed those recommendations and, working collaboratively, extended them and ensured that those recommendations were enacted into Irish law in our Climate Act. Our story continues and our people will be at its heart. Climate action can be frustrating and slow, but our people do want us to take action. Carl Sagan said of our planet, on that blue dot, that's where everyone you know and everyone you ever heard of and every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives. It's a very small stage in the great cosmic arena. And he said that this perspective underscores our responsibility to preserve and cherish that blue dot, the only home we have. From our home in Ireland to yours, we extend our heartfelt goodwill to you in your work to preserve and cherish our shared home. Gorev Magwiv Galair, Berbua Agus Banot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, on my list, I have Gennaro Migliore, President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. Thank you, uh, President. It's an honor for me uh, to speak in the Chamber of Deputies, which I'm a member of, at the, in, as a President of the Mediterranean uh, Parliamentary Assembly. I'd very like to uh, thank uh, the organizers of this important event. The 34 countries we represent, uh, more than half a billion people for time have been uh, involved in setting up parliamentary mechanisms among us which can also represent the fulfillment of the words spoken here. We've all heard the dramatic message of the Secretary General of the United Nations, and we know that we are in a red uh, situation. Our lives can change. Uh, there's a major social impact, uh, not just uh, climate impact underway. Climate-driven uh, migrations are something which we uh, concern ourselves with, and because of this, we need to be able to look Beyond uh, immediate issues, there's uh, social impact and environmental impact and also a problem for the security of our countries. Therefore, unless there are adequate measures, we might have 200 million people who are forced to emigrate and leave their homes. Therefore, dear colleagues, we have run out of time, and this is why I am reminded of the uh, words of Dante Alighieri, greatest poet who has uh, Ulysses after he crosses the Straits of Gibraltar. You are not made to live as brutes, but to follow uh, knowledge and wisdom. This, we stand together and we win together. I have on my list Mohammed Nasri bin Abdulaziz, a member of the Chamber of Representatives of Malaya, Malaysia. Mr. President and fellow parliamentarians, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today, sharing the Malaysian Parliament's contribution to achieving Conference of Parties 26. As a government developing its strategy to achieve deep reductions in emission and accelerating the development of low carbon cities agenda, the Malaysian parliament plays an oversight function by examining whether the executive branch delivers 
and implement the laws, programs, and budgets for national development efficiently and effectively. The Parliament of Malaysia has given priority to the members of Parliament to scrutinize national budgets to see whether they deliver on SDG outcomes and effectively target society's most marginalized group. This ensures that SDG is made available and utilized in an effective, transparent, and accountable way. In terms of lawmaking, the Malaysian Parliament is revising and adopting laws that directly support the various SDGs and the entirety of the 2030 Agenda, such as national development plans or national sustainable development strategies. In July this year, 2021, Malaysia has submitted the National Determined Contribution to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. As a representative of the people, we are able to integrate their perspectives and interests into the legal framework developed to achieve the SDG and to counter climate change. We get to inform them of the goals and climate action and the potential to make their lives and the lives of their fellow peoples better. Such effort will raise awareness of climate change among parliamentarians, building cross-party support to address national climate risks and ensure environmental sustainability. Thank you. I have my, on my list now Leonid Zlutsky, member of the State Duma of the Russian Federation. It is a video message. Um, greetings, dear colleagues from Moscow. Unfortunately, it's not possible for me to come to Rome because uh, we have uh, just had our uh, elections for the State Duma, our eighth uh, parliament, and we have a first plenary session next Tuesday on the 12th of October. I'm very glad to be able to greet the uh, participants in the parliamentary meeting preparatory to the uh, United Nations Conference on Climate Change. And on your uh, agenda, there are points of uh, very great importance. The climate uh, problem and efforts which can be made in order to overcome the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, these are points of uh, great importance for all uh, developed countries and also in uh, multilateral and regional organizations. It, uh, more and more attention is being devoted to the protection of the environment and green uh, transformation. And this means that We need to uh, look to the period following the pandemic. Russia uh, attaches great importance to the issue of climate change. This is borne out by its active participation in the uh, discussions on all international interparliamentary fora and uh, in the context of the implementation of the framework agreement on climate change, the uh, Paris Agreement. Having said that, we uh, base ourselves on the idea that the Paris Agreement continues to provide a solid basis on the, on, uh, the basis of international um, law in order to um, achieve uh, sustainable uh, growth. This parliamentary meeting is held on the eve of the meeting on uh, climate change in Glasgow. Uh, certainly, uh, there are many things which mm, can be proposed for the agenda. 
the leaders in our country have emphasized the promotion of low carbon emission economy, in particular by establishing mechanisms to regulate CO2 emissions, investing and funding the green transition, and we uh, view positive um, conditions to relaunch our contacts with uh, members of the Euroasiatic Economic Community and uh, BRICS, and we're ready to uh, strengthen our cooperation in these two uh, areas on the interparliamentary level. Dear colleagues, cooperation on climate issues should be um, foreseeable predictable and transparent. Climate change problems and the protection of the environment should uh, bring the world community together rather than split it. It is equally important to avoid unilateral measures, uh, which may go against the interests of other actors and the world community in general. In this connection, the role of uh, parliamentarians is uh, vital. Dear colleagues, I would like to take this opportunity to forward to all of you my best wishes, and uh, I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. On my list, I now have Jacques Wagner, member of the Federal Senate of Brazil. You have the floor. President, é da percepção internacional que países em desenvolvimento foram brutalmente atingidos pela pandemia da Covid-19. As diferenças globais ficam claramente evidenciadas. Covid-19 is perceived as a major threat in the international community. There's a great difference between the possibility of reaction of the most uh, developed countries compared with the less developed countries. Um, and the Senate of Brazil currently finds itself with a uh, opposition majority in the Federal Senate. And uh, 2020 was a very difficult uh, year for Brazil. 6,000 Brazilians lost their lives in this battle against the pandemic because of the scarce and uh, few health measures adopted by the government. The effect of uh, human activities on our planet will generate other pandemics and more deaths. Therefore, today we are here at this uh, climate conference, and we are, uh, um, cons we consider that uh, financial measures are of great importance. As a developing country, we cannot adopt measures which uh, hinder the development of the country, but at the same time, we must take care and take care of and protect. Uh, climate change countries in the south of the world. Because of this, we've um, channeled all our efforts into reconstructing the country with the following measures. First of all, we set up a uh, ecological generation forum with a wide contribution from civil society. Second initiative, which is not just limited to the territory of Brazil, during COP26 with other Latin American countries were going to establish a uh, legislator's um, ob observatory in order to foster um, fair development. And we are going to try and promote the best models and tools in order to implement the, reco the recovery of our peoples practically. Thank you. Thank you. On my list, I now have Abdel Karim Al Maya, who is a member of the Parliament of Jordan. 
In the name of God, the All Merciful, the Compassionate, Jordan is honored to have responded to the invitation in order to come to this meeting. meeting. These are parliamentary events linked to the preparation of COP26 next, next month in Glasgow. Jordan is very keen on playing its part on the international scene, and we would like to thank all of those who contributed to the organization of these two events, particularly the IPU and the Italian government. My heartfelt thanks also go to all delegations who have come here and who have presented their perspective on things here. It is indeed something very important. This planet is not given to us. It is given to us only as a keepsake. It is also something that appears in the Quran. This earth is a keepsake. It is something we keep for the next generations. And it is therefore a duty of ours to protect this environment. Today, climate change has several layers, if I dare say. There is the there are the changes that have to do with uh, in within the with the earth uh, changes that have to do with extreme weather um, events etc and there are also the events that have to do with man but in both cases we need to interfere if we are to save this planet. We know that our world has also to face several parallel challenges, including wars, conflicts, and others, which means that the problem of pollution is only increased by the current circumstances prevailing across the globe. This makes it quite difficult for us to continue fighting against climate change. Jordan will do its duty and does its duty despite wars, despite conflicts and despite the current situations. Wars and conflicts are not the reason behind less rain, but we do what we can because when you have more refugees, you need to give them more water, more food. Jordan is planting more trees for people. One more time, we would like to thank you for organizing these reunions, and we would like to reassert one more time that we will do our share in order to fight climate change together. Thank you, and may the blessing of God be upon you. Thank you. On my list, I have Mircea Fichap, member of the Chamber of Deputies of Romania. Distinguished colleagues, it gives me a great pleasure to address you today. And first of all, I'd like to thank the Italian hosts for the good organization of this event during these difficult times generated by the COVID-19 pandemic. As legislators, we are bringing today our contribution to the reflection on the way forward in implementing ambitious commitments for green inclusive and sustainable recovery, proving once again that parliamentary multilateral cooperation is important. We believe that parliaments, according to their specific legislative oversight and budgetary prerogatives, can play a significant role to support achieving the Paris Agreement goals. Dear colleagues, in Glasgow, we will be faced with the raised expectation of the world, and in particular, the younger generation who are rightly asking us to protect their future. This is why, especially in the light of the latest IPCC report, we know that we have no time to waste. Climate change can no longer be a rhetoric, but must instead be a constant drive to ensure that we all move together towards the global transition to net zero. While the EU is committed to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 55% up to 2030, Romania overpassed this target in 2017 and has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions by almost 60%, and we will continue our efforts to reduce emissions. Finally, I'd like to stress that through parliamentary diplomacy tools, we can play a crucial role 
both at national and international level, to raising awareness of the challenge and the necessity for urgent action to address the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. On my list, I now have Arista Gedviliene, President of the Environment Committee of the Lithuanian Parliament. Environmental and climate change impacts do, do not respect national borders. Therefore, environment and climate changes uh, targets can only be attained uh, uh, through joining global actions. Lithuania has always supported and continues to support both international and EU objectives in fighting climate change. Lithuania can serve as an example of how small country can reduce its impact on climate change by almost 60 percent in relatively short period of time, and at the same time develop a smarter and higher value added uh, economy. Lithuania has already reduced its emissions by 58 percent compared to 1990. The biggest transformation took place in the uh, uh, energy sector. We have abandoned and safe and uh, polluting forms of electricity, gener uh, electricity uh, generation. In the heating sector, we have replaced uh, important fossil uh, resources by 70 percent with biofuels, thus reducing not only the impact on climate change, but also or uh, dependence on price of imported raw materials. We spent about two and a half billion euros on um, important fuels annually. Therefore, Lithuania is uh, uh, shifting to renewable ener energy based on local resources in order to achieve energy independence and the reducing of fossil fuels. By 2030, we aim to generate 45 percent of the energy we need from renewable energy sources. We see climate change policy as policy of energy independence. For the end, many of you have mentioned that important role of parliaments in addressing climate change. So it seems that everybody knows what to do. So let's do it. Thank you. Many thanks. On my list, I have Ibrahim Mohamed Bukhar, uh, member of the Chamber of Representatives of Nigeria. Good evening, President. In Niger, we are focusing on uh, guaranteeing the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the measures associated with that. It's also very important for us to implement the SDGs. The goal of COP26 is to fight against climate change. And we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic something which has interrupted this fight against climate change. It has weakened economies. It has had an effect on uh, governance as well and uh, the freedoms of citizens. We need to relaunch our actions for the good of the planet. We need to overcome COVID-19 and also fight against climate change. The way we're going to do this is by putting in place measures to grow economies and to put in place long-term actions to 
ensure decarbonization of our economies. We need to have measures in agriculture. We need to conserve our water resources. We need to decrease our carbon emissions. All of this will reduce emissions globally and hopefully avoid further increases in global temperatures. I thank you. Grazie. Thank you. On my list, I have Abdel Karim Faisal de Faladermi, member of the Arab Parliament. In the name of God, the all merciful, the compassionate. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. President for giving me the floor. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I salute you and may the blessing of God be upon you. First of all, on behalf of the Arab Parliament, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks and my gratitude to all those who have organized To all those who have organized this meeting, they have, exert, they have spared no effort in organizing an, a high-level event, an event that is as important as the topic we are tackling today. What can parliamentarians do in order to face climate change and its devastating consequences? There has been several discussions over the past couple of days. And although we have been talking about financing, and although we have been talking about several elements, we believe that there is something important to say. Financing is important. Without financing, there can be no efforts, there can be no program, and there can be no implementation. However, there is something even more important. That is, what is the part that parliamentarians can play? What are the instruments at their disposal in order to implement those policies, those ideas, those national strategies that would in turn decrease the effects of climate change. Today, our societies feel every day the brunt of, of climate change, and we have seen a good example of that in Oman recently. New legislations are needed. Old legislations need to be amended so that a new legislative framework is born, a legislative framework that will not merely stop and decrease greenhouse gas emissions, but rather will look into a holistic approach for policies, plans, and strategies so that all of them together embrace the fight against climate change. The Arab Parliament believes that climate change is one of its top priorities, and we encourage all of you to give it, it to give it precedence over everything else. One more time, we would like to thank all of you for your presence and your contributions. Thank you. On my list, I now have Yusuf Makeri, member of the National Parliament of Sierra Leone. Andiamo, andiamo avanti. Let us move on. On my list, I have Karina Nino, Interparliamentary Secretary of the Latin American Parliament. A very good afternoon to you, President. It's an honor for me to be here today representing the Latin American Parliament. I think it's very important to recognize the role of parliamentarians in the fight against climate change. It's of vital importance. We need to strengthen collaboration with all stakeholders in the private sector and civil society. 
So it's very important to have the participation of parliamentarians in this effort because there are budget functions which are carried out and budgetary decisions which are taken by parliamentarians. This is why it's very important that parliamentarians be involved in all of these processes. It's very important that we have the involvement of inter-parliamentary institutions in this process. I think it's very good, the suggestion that we've had from Brazil in relation to the observation status. Latin America is one of the regions with the highest amount of biodiversity in the world. And we have been working to protect our environment. We need to find solutions together, taking into account economic and social issues, but we also need to protect the environment. We need to look at clean energy alternatives as well. We have seen in countries like Costa Rica where they have been making huge strides forwards in the area of uh, renewable energies. The time has come, colleagues, now. It's time for us to move from words to action. Latin America calls on everyone to work together to fight against the thing which is affecting us, which is climate change. We have joined together to fight against the pandemic, and we can do so again in relation to the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. On my list, I have Putu Santana Rulana, Vice President of the Committee for Interparliamentary Cooperation of the House of Representatives of Indonesia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Currently, we are facing point of no return, where we could not delay our action in accelerating our response to climate change according to Paris Agreement. In this critical moment, it is our collective responsibility as parliamentarians to scrutinize the government policies on national and international climate change issues. Kindly allow me to elaborate more on what role that parliament could play. First, promoting climate change action in the context of sustainable development, as is stated in the Paris Agreement. Climate change is closely linked with many other issues in achieving, achieving our development goals. Thus, climate change legislation needs to be part of a wider policy vision that promotes sustainable and inclusive development. Second, we can lead by example in contributing to climate action by strengthening and enabling environment through climate legislation. Third, we have to strengthen global partnership by joining our force together, we shall ampli amplify our messages and send a stronger drive for policymakers to act, including at the COP26. We could foster knowledge exchange through dialogues, workshops, and sharing best practices. At the same time, as the voice of our citizen, we must enhance multi-stakeholder partnership. Government may enact policies but it is non-state actors who implement action on the ground. Thus, we must support bottom-up initiative led by our citizens, innovative businesses, and various stakeholders. Together, of course, we can make a real difference and bring positive change for our planet. Thank you, and I will see you, of course, in Bali, Indonesia, for 144th IPU Assembly in March 2021. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. I'd like to ask whether the keynote speakers want to briefly reply. Prego. Please. Gracias. Thank you, President. I think that everything has been said. 
following the interventions from the country representatives. We know what we need to do. We know the scale of the problem that uh, lies before us, and we know what our role is in national parliaments. Our role in national parliaments is very important to make sure that uh, COP26 and what is decided at COP26 is implemented in our countries. I would like to thank all of the speakers who have spoken. We cannot waste a single minute. We need to act now to face and address climate change. Thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you. I would like to thank you for your very interesting input. This brings us to the end of the forum.